Welcome, friends. Thank you for being with us, all of you, and a special welcome to Angela Dews. Thank you for that sweet, sweet offering from Ty. Um, I just want to uh, read a, a, just a short offering from Angela. Angela is the editor and curator from this collection, Still in the City, Still in the City, uh, a collection of offerings from her community Dharma leader, Sangha friends, including folks that have been here with us, including at least one that's here with us now, Miss Io. Uh, but Angela writes, our experience of practice in cities offers occasions for finding refuge, of course, but also for awakening from the illusion of separation. The way we were taught by our teachers who were taught by their teachers in Southeast and South Asia in the 1960s and 70s. And we offer the intention to explicitly pay attention to suffering in relationships, including the greed, hatred, and delusion that manifest as prejudice and injustice. She goes on to say, diligence and clear comprehension are essential to the task of being in cities. Mindfulness is taught as a way, as a practice to alleviate stress and to manage pain and to know and to be with what is. The mindfulness practice we share has an intention to train for deeper understanding and change. The Buddha called such diligence the necessary strength for returning to the object of meditation, to mindfulness, with balance and continuity, through all of what we are called, the 10,000 joys and the 10,000 sorrows journey. Welcome, Miss Angela. Thank you. Um, thank you. <laughs> Um, it's interesting because I, um, yeah, a lot happens in a, in a being over time. And um, I believe, well, let me start with what I was going to say, because it, it's interesting that it should, that you should read that, because that's kind of what I wanted to talk about tonight, was about Sangha and relationship. Um, and I'm always happy to come here because this is such a gorgeous Sangha that you've created and we've developed and nurtured. It's so wonderful. And for me, Sanghas, um, besides nurturing my practice and each other's practice, it's a way to practice relationships. You know, Sangha is not all a, a birthday cake and a picnic. Um, my Harlem Sangha gets quite interesting, I must say, um, what we call Sangha drama. Um, and having gone through that and going through that, I've learned a lot about myself and about the practice and about the fact that the Buddha was a person, a human being. And so when he talks about this stuff, it's not conceptual. He knows. He had a community. Um, so anyway, I did write a little something down. In 2005, Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh took a group of Western Buddhists with him when he returned to Vietnam after 40 years in exile. And he took, I went with him, and um, not because I was a deep practitioner, but he sent out an invitation to see who was interested. And I said, well, I'm interested, having no idea that that would be accepted. And I was, and it was quite lovely, I must say. It was uh, three weeks. We started in Hanoi, and we ended up in Ho Chi Minh City, which used to be Saigon, um, traveling in a bus down the Indian River, sometimes jumping in. There was a time when we were um, in buses, and the buses stopped along the river and all the monks and nuns ran out and jumped in the water. And there were all these little brown robes bouncing around in the water because these are people from fishing villages. These, these monks and nuns are fishing village people. And when they saw that water and they stopped, it was not about, you know, shall I, shall I wait for Ty? Shall I have a conversation? It's like, let me jump in this water. And it was quite lovely. And Ty's 
bus came a little bit later, Thich Nhat Hanh's bus came a little bit later. And I was waiting to see, I'm probably one of the few who was waiting to see what he would do. And he just sat and he smiled and watched them bounce. So um, the monks in, uh, who were in Vietnam while he was gone got up to some silliness. Um, they were riding motor scooters and getting paid to do marriages. And this is an aside. So he went to see about them. And while he was gone, his order of interbeings trained us and taught us and we walked and talked and it was lovely. Um, but when the buses came back, I can't, I don't know if I can even say this out loud without crying. And the, the buses came back and Thich Nhat Hanh and the monks and nuns came off those buses. That chant we just heard, we chanted for them. And then they chanted it with us. And we smiled and some of us wept. It was so gorgeous to come back together and pay homage to Avalokiteshvara, the um, Bodhisattva who heard the cries of the world. Um, while standing at the gates of paradise, Avalokiteshvara heard the anguish of the earth behind her, below her, and she went back and turned away from the reward of eternal bliss to deal with the suffering um, of the earth and therefore found um, immortality in our hearts, in the hearts of suffering people, because that's who we turn to. She hears the suffering of the world. So it was a, that's why they're chant, that's why we chant. That's why she's on the statue, she's the statue that's in most altars. She's in my altar all over my house and all over um, Asia and Southeast Asia and many Western uh, altars. So take a moment, we're gonna do a little meditation ground yourself. Uh, we start with silence. Silence is a still water that reflects what's going on. It helps us see these, these things more clearly. And it helps to set your intention to gather yourself to meditate. And know that that intention, I have the intention to gather myself and the effort to do so is all that I'm responsible for. That's my job. The, re the outcome is not my, is not my business. Um, the result is not my job. It's a kind of grace that comes in the piece that, um, that was read from the book. It was the notion that um, the diligence to practice um, brings us to an understanding of refuge, but also an understanding deeper than that of um, the fake idea that we're separate, that there's somehow that I'm here by myself and that you're out there by yourself and that this is not a practice about connecting. And I wanted to talk today about connecting and starting with this meditation. One way is that Peter Dubinan always says, gladden the mind. Before you try to meditate, gladden the mind. And one way to do that is think of something that you did that was um, generous, and that someone was glad for, or something that was given to you that, out of generosity. And maybe put a smile to your lip. Think of something sweet and gladden your mind as you sit. Because after having a day, and I don't know how your day is going, New York is very hot and very busy. See if we can come to the stillness and sit and then find some gladness, some joy. So how is the mind? Is there a little bit of gladness? Is there ability to have a little smile? And then how is the body? Starting with the breath at the nostril, breathe in and know that you're breathing in and know it's flavor. It's not thinking about breathing. It's feeling the breathing, tasting the breathing, knowing the breathing all the way in and then releasing all the way out. And then that little space before the next in breath, really being aware of and conscious of and inhabiting the space of breathing. The whole body of the breath, from the whole in breath to the whole release of the out breath. It's a good object of meditation because it's always with us and it's in the present. The breath is not here and then it is and we note it and then it's gone and then it's back. It's lovely. It's a perfect object of meditation. So if that breath awareness was like a flashlight or a spotlight, now widen it so it's like a lamp and feel the breath in the whole body as energy or a massage. 
So I feel myself as a body breathing. I love the fact that I could breathe into my belly and fill it up. And then when I release that belly breath, feel my diaphragm drop, 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 drop down into my feet, down into the earth, release, breathe back in. So the body breath, particularly the belly breath, is a full breath, a massage breath. Breathe the whole body, uh, breathe in through the whole body, It'd be the body breathing. Just for a minute, feel the body breathing. We paid attention to, to the breath. But now let feel the breath in the, um, leave the breath in the background and be aware of the touch points of the body, where your hands are touching, how they're touching each other or they're touching the thighs. Touching, touching, feeling the butt on the seat. Thich Nhat Hanh talks about the fist, feet kissing the earth. I love that. Feel the feet on the earth, on the floor, the earth. It's a sensation. It's a sensation of touch. And then the sensation of sound, hearing. Because that's all this is. This experience is the senses, the six senses. In Buddhism, the six senses, the mind is thinking. The six senses, noticing the experience. So now we're noticing sound, hearing. Hearing's a good one, because it's not here, then it is. We note its flavor, whether it's pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. Then it's gone. And it's also in the present. And like all of our experience, it's not perfect. It's not permanent. And it's not personal. So just for a minute, see if you can feel the body, the five senses that are making up the, the body. The touching, the hearing, letting the breath massage. And perhaps you're noticing a taste in your mouth or a smell, the smell of summer in the city. Those are the senses. Finally, thoughts and feelings seems to land on the heart mind like a silent sound. One of my teachers pointed out to me that actually it's not so much that thoughts land it's that we get bored with the breath and go look for something else to do, something else to pay attention to. So we become aware of thoughts. And if we can think of the thought as thinking, thinking, thinking without a story, it just becomes another sensation. It's a silent sound. It's moving words. Thought is just another sensation that we're meeting our experience with. And another wonderful teaching um, Kitty Saro suggested, try to see if you can have one thought, just one. And when it's over, drop, drop into not, not thinking, to silence until the next one comes. It's a powerful experience. Because my thoughts are like an elephant parade. Each one is attached to the next one and it makes a story. But if I can detach and just look at them as a single thought, it's a very different experience. And not the story, not I am thinking about dinner, thinking, thinking. Maybe my body is hungry. Without the details, just thinking. Or I'm sleepy, just thinking. And feeling. Breathing in at the nostrils, the face, the top of the head, and then turning that flashlight of awareness to a lamp and being the whole body breathing all the way down to the feet touching the earth.
and if a thought lands, just thinking, just thinking without judgment, because that's what the mind does. It thinks, just thinking and see if you can let it go after the first thought without making a story out of it, without judging yourself. Yeah, I'm thinking, that's what I do, thinking. And then back to breathing, if you can. For the last five minutes, I want to offer a meditation that I'm re um, pulled from Resma Menikam's book, My Grandmother's Hands. It's subtitled Racial, Racialized Trauma and the Pathway to Mending Our Hearts and Bodies. And this is one of the meditations he offers. Take a moment to ground yourself in your own body. 
Notice the outline of your skin and the slight pressure of the air around it. Experience the firmer, the firmer pressure of the chair, bed, or couch beneath you, or the ground, or the floor beneath your feet. Can you sense hope in your body? Where? How does your body experience that hope? Is it a release or an expansion? A tightening born of eagerness or anticipation? Not what are you hoping for? How does the hope feel? And where do you feel it? It's a sensation. It might be the freedom of a burden, but it's hope. And of course, do you experience any fear in your body? If so, where? How does it manifest as tightness, as a painful radiance, as a dead, hard spot? Every time I've done that, people get mad that I, they have to pay attention to the fear. But see if you can. And if it gets to be too much, come back to the breath. Let it go. And know that it's not personal. It's not permanent. And it's certainly not perfect. It's just an experience. But if you can, see if you feel where it is in your body, where you're feeling it. It's just a sensation. It's not who you are. And it's going to change. Perhaps you can feel the hope change, the fear change in these few minutes that we have left. Oops. Allow the feelings, both of them, offer them a cup of tea, but tell them they can't bring luggage because they can't stay. They're visitors, they've come. You can welcome them, you can sit them down, you can have a cup of tea, and then you let them go. So before, um, I, I do want to remind you that Avalokiteshvara uh, Bodhisattva is a being who can help us liberate ourselves from fear. That's one of the things that that being does. She listens to the suffering of the earth and her um, listening and her caring helps to alleviate that fear. Ajahn Sumedho said, we concentrate, we become distracted, we concentrate again. It can be hard with distractions and pain discovering what mind you bring to your seat. It's kind of a patience, being willing to bear with something, allowing it to change naturally. Sometimes situations in our life are just this way. There's nothing one can do, so we allow them to be that way. And that's to add on to the end of our meditation. And remember, emptiness is potential. Letting it go is potential. The bell will not ring when it is stuffed with myself. My mind cannot find creativity and compassion when it's full of my own perceptions and mental formations. Equanimity is the answer, is the way that I can allow myself to hold all this. It allows me to honor doubt and it, honors, and it allows me to honor don't know mind, to stay, to stay open to uncertainty and to still know in this moment, I am enough. I have another story, which I just remembered. I was at Dharmajiri out in South Africa with um, Kitisaro and Tanisara, and we did the chant to Kuan Yin, who's a Balakishinavera, 108 times, bowing, bowing, all of us bowing, bowing, bowing. A big storm came up. We could feel the leaves against the, the hut, branches, branches, bowing, bowing, chanting, chanting. Oh my God, a big old storm. And we got to the 108 and we stopped, and the storm stopped. I swear to God. We opened the door, we went outside, you could see a star. I don't know what the, the storm left. Uh, Kitty Sorrow said there's a dragon on the mountain, which is possible. Maybe the dragon got tired. And what I told him afterwards, because I'm not sure I believe in an interventionist being, I told him I have don't know mind. That gave me the ability to open my mind to say, I don't know what just happened. 
I was there, it happened, I don't know. And so that's what equanimity allows me to do. It allows me to, to, to bow 108 times, even though bowing is you know, an anathema to a, a, a culture that had me bowing to, to things. Um, but I bowed 108 times and I believed it. I went into it, I felt the earth and, and then I heard the storm go away. So before we finish, the end of this is gonna be a small groups where we'll talk about where your fear and your hope landed in your own body. Not what you're afraid of and what you hope for, hopefully. We'll, I'm hoping that we won't go there, but just how it felt and whether or not they both landed in the same place which happens for some of us, not all of us. It's a spiritual practice. Um, Bhikkhu Bodhi said um, something about a spiritual practice, which I can't find. A spiritual tradition is not a shallow stream in which one can wet one's feet and then beat a quick retreat to the shore. It is a mighty tumultuous river, which would rush through the entire landscape of one's life. And if one truly wishes to travel on it, one must be courageous enough to launch one's boat and head out for the depths. Courageous enough to feel the hope and the fear. But the good news is we don't have to do it alone. Um, Vimalasara, who's been here before, will be back. And I'm sure when she comes back, she'll talk about her book, African Wisdom. Um, she will no doubt talk about it. And in that book, she started by saying she would talk about how black Buddhists can liberate, she can talk about liberation. And she decided it's more than Buddhists and it's more than black Buddhists. It's, it, and she has Rastafarians and Christians and all manner of beings in here talking in a chapter. And I wrote a chapter and I'm gonna read a little bit from my chapter if I can find my piece of paper. Um, I wrote a chapter in African wisdom. I'll teach on it tonight because it places me as a woman of color who practices and teaches in cities. The same thing that uh, uh, Stacey brought up. Um, it places me as a woman of color who practices and teaches in cities. It's the fierce practice of urban Buddhism. Loving silence, but also building community where we can share love, compassion, joy, and equanimity, equanimity and deep listening. That's Sangha. And it's a place to practice relationship, as I said earlier. So I'm gonna read this um, if I can find it. Hmm. My chapter is called Healing My Broken Heart. I'm a black Buddhist who is working in Harlem to get a candidate elected. They were committed to protecting the homes and jobs and health of the dominant black and Latino population who are already there against the greedy opportunists who are not always white and not always outsiders. When I brought my broken heart to Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh, Thai, my first teacher, he said, this is important, harmony is possible. Your way of life is your message. Don't think because you are poor, you are helpless. Anger is not the only source of energy. Compassion is a verb. Mindful consumption is essential for community building. Community building. So some teachers, I'm trying to expand my community of uh, Harlem Insight at this point. And some teachers are distilling the Buddha's teaching, the Buddha's canon, canon to its fundamentals. So it'll be palpable to Westerners who might be scared off by using the Buddha's name or calling it Buddhism. So they call it all kinds of other stuff. And we all do that. We do it, we teach in prisons and schools and hospitals so we can get paid. We, you know, we talk about this, the concept of Buddhism, uh, stress release and pain release. But I'm not trying to make that message easy to ignore for my people in the Harlem Insight Sangha. They might, they, I want them to ask, what are they up to over there? Can I bring my whole self to the cushion? How, can I be re, how will I be received? And to, to say it to populations um, who have been offered a different message. Um, if I'm asking them to be still, know that they've been told not to stand still. There's work to be done and you can be a target if you're not dancing in and out of the light. And if I'm not mad at the oppressor, then he got away with it. All of these things come in and some of my flyers, I'm trying to figure out flyers that'll say some of that so that people might be interested to show up. Um, and I can say my sharing that teaching is more than 2,500 years old from a land of brown people. And as a black Buddhist, I can see that anger can be a heavenly message. But as Ty said, it cannot be our only anger, our only energy. And then finding a way to say it, 
the fundamental essence of what the Buddha taught is there's suffering, everything changes, and there is no self. But Ruth King, for instance, said it brilliantly. The experience is not perfect. It's not permanent. It's not personal. I can teach from that. My Sangha loves that. We can start from there. So finding ways to present the Dharma and the teaching in a way that lands and can be understood. In my heart, in, for instance, in my Harlem, in my Harlem Sangha, um, it admits to be, we admit to being Buddhists. I was cautioned that it would turn off my neighbors. I should call it mindfulness. But then it would seem like I thought of it. Um, so what I did is I called Buddhism and it works. I mean, I can't leave flyers. If I go to a senior citizen, I can bring flyers, but I can't kind of leave them in the bulletin board. I have to take them with me, but I, you know, it's still, it works. One of my Sangha said, um, I love my Jesus. He tells me to be good. You guys tell me how. Another teacher said that is because Jesus died so young. We could have that conversation because we are real about what brought us to this cushion and we don't have to pretend and leave some of it at the door so we can have the experience. I think that's really important, really, really important. Gina Sharp, a founding member, at, a founding teacher at New York Insight said, it's not about diversity, it's about power and love. I love that. It's about power and love. So two of my white Sangha members asked if it was supposed to be a POC and they were misplaced. I said, I know how it feels to be the only one in the room. Do you stay? Do you feel uncomfortable? Please stay. She said, no, we feel welcome. We just wonder, there's so many people of color here. And so we had a moment of connection and reconnection and said it out loud. Um, and it's a diverse Sangha. Um, and we have diverse teachers, a, a myriad of diverse, diverse teachers. And to end, I would like to remember that on the night before he was murdered, Dr. King gave his I have a dream speech. I always heard him to mean that the people who would get to the promised land were we, Black people. A benefit of these times we're living in now allows me to hear it differently, to hear something else, to hear probably what Dr. King meant, that who will get to the promised land are all of us who share the desire and contention for connection and justice and love and peace. It's a collective process. I just figured that out <laughs> belatedly. And I figured it out because of the pandemic. I figured it out because of the sanghas. I figured it out because of this sangha, of the Common Ground Sangha. All the ways that I sit with people who may not agree with everything and heaven help me if they did, we don't always agree with everything, but we can come together and support each other and ask questions and listen deeply. So it's a collective process. Um, and I wanted to break out. I, ugh, I finished kind of quickly. I thought I'd have more time, but we have time for a good breakout session and conversation after. Is that cool, Stacy? Um, so the question is, as I said before, where in the body did you feel the hope and the fear? Did you fear it in two separate places? Do you fear it, feel it in the same place? How did it feel? How did it feel to be instructed to do that, to go and find it? Um, I've been told I've done this before and I've been told that it maybe it, it peed the pe people off. They were like, I don't want to feel like that. I'm fine, why should I go look for fear? So what did, it, what did, that, um, what did that experience feel like? And how did it feel to try to meditate with those feelings? Um, practice offering deep listening, compassion and metta, not because they deserve it, but because I need to open my heart to include all beings, those I love, those I am indifferent to, and those that I don't agree with at all. And so these small groups and Sangha are good practice for such practice. Welcome back, everybody. Nice to see you. Some of you look kind of worn out, I must say. <laughs> it's a big subject, two big subjects. I'm not gonna to try to lead this conversation. It feels like you probably, we only have about 20 minutes that there's probably um, some conversation you wanna have. I don't know if people have spokesmen from their group that wanna give an overview or whether people just wanna speak on their own. We didn't give you instructions, so go for it. Whoever wants to share, please share for you, about yourself. And if you share about somebody else, make sure that it's okay with them. If you're gonna tell somebody else's business And it's interesting to pick hope and fear as two little words and drop it in when both of them, as you say, are huge conversations, huge. 
Yeah, one of the problem, one of the um, challenges of words like hope and fear for me are that um, there, you know, I could do a whole, it would have been a whole talk about hope um, and how we use hope to um, color a relationship and anticipate and not be happy with, you know, hope is, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, I mean, I think that the, the problem with dropping it in like this, unless I can keep it into a conversation, keep it with a conversation of where does it land in your body? If I can keep it with where does it land in your body, then we can talk about it in the way that I try to talk about it. Yeah, I can talk about it as a meditation object. But if I talk about it in terms of um, the way that I see the world, then it becomes much more complicated and it, it can become grasping and it becomes um, judging. Um, and I tried to add words that would pull us back from there and just bring us as, as if hope was a, 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 a mountain pool a, 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 and, and you were in the pool and it was lovely and you saw stuff, but you just stayed where you were because it was lovely there. But it's very difficult to do as a human being. And I, I, I accepted that it's almost impossible. Um, and we only had a short time and I was using it to try to get you back into your body more than an understanding of what hope feels like and what hope means. I don't feel like I answered your question. It was a hard question and I don't think I think I talked around it, but if anybody else has anything to say about it, please feel free. Thank you very much. It's interesting because each time I've learned something and I think I'm gonna do it different next time. But I don't and maybe I will and maybe it's faith. I don't know. It's interesting, and maybe the conversation is a is a whole conversation about, um, yeah, the, the idea that that hope is not a Buddhist concept because that happens all the time. I have conversation, and people say, "Well, I want to give them a piece of my mind." I'm like, "A piece of my mind is not a Buddhist concept." I mean, there's so many things that come up in the way we communicate, the way we see the world, and how we relate to each other. And if it brings, it, and that's all. It, it almost all. It's almost all you have to say. Hope is not a Buddhist concept. Um, uh, and it, it, it changes the conversation in a very particular and important way. I appreciate that. I'm gonna pay attention to it and, 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 and study because it's come up before. Um, and as I said, I use it because it really works as a tool to understand how um, feelings land in the body, how we hold, um, hold things, but that's interesting. And it's interesting as a teacher, you want to have the answers. I don't have the answer to these questions. Um, and I really agree that hope is not a Buddhist concept. The notion of feeling those, but, but as I said, Buddha was a person and the conversation about how these feelings come up, what we do with them, how we conversate about them are very, very important to the practice. So, but I don't have the answers and this is sending me back to the, to the mat. <laughs> that's not the, that's not the right image, but um, yeah, and it's happened before. I've used this, I use this a lot. And each time I've done it, um, I've gotten this kind of feedback, other kinds of feedback. It's a very rich conversation. So the book that I pulled it out of the, um, is about trauma. It's not a Buddhist book, it's about trauma. And that makes sense. Um, it's a big word, it's a big word. And the, the hope of seeing a, 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 which isn't happening now in this hot weather, but that you see that bud and you have hope and then one day it becomes a flower. It's simple, those kind of, and language that talks about the difference, what that, what that hope is, um, is important. I, I, this is really good for me. I'm glad, I'm glad we had this conversation. I hope that it, it stirred things in you and that we'll continue to look and talk and study and practice and sit and see what that hope feels like in your meditation. Um, or if it's not hope, what you might call it, what that feeling is that Sherry felt um, that it may not be hope or that Jillian felt. Because um, hope ends up being um, something that I have to do something about. That's very different. It, that's very different. Anyway, I'm done. Any last thoughts anyone would like to share into this space? Have you heard the dedication of merit that Zen, Zenju Earthland 
Manuel. It has not been shared here. Would you like to offer it? I will offer. It's a last intro, a last chapter in the book. For all beings by Zenju Earthland Manuel. May all beings be cared for and loved, be listened to, understood, and acknowledged despite different views. Be accepted for who they are in this moment. Be allowed to live without fear of having their lives taken away or their bodies violated. May all beings be well in its broadest sense, be fed, be clothed, be treated as if their life is precious, be held in the eyes of each other as family. May all beings be appreciated, feel welcomed anywhere on the planet. Be freed from acts of hatred and desperation, including war, poverty, slavery, and street crimes. Live upon the planet housed and protected from harm. Be given what is needed to live fully without scarcity. Enjoy life living without fear of one another. Be able to speak freely in a voice and mind of undeniable love. May all beings receive and share the gifts of life. Be given time to rest, be still and experience silence. May all beings be awake. Thank you, Angela, and thank you all. Oh. <laughs> hmm. I invite you to um, support the opportunity for Angela to continue bringing her wisdom and teaching um, by supporting her livelihood through the gift of Donna. Donna is the the only support that common ground uh, receives and that is how we are able to offer these teachings invite uh, teachers wise and beautiful and funny like angela so we invite you to offer what you can we're also opening the center back up slowly so if you um, are able and interested your offering may be in the way of physical support at the center and as always um, we take uh, your financial offerings two-thirds of offerings at programs such as this are offered to the guest teacher and then common ground retains one-third for operations of the center Jessica so kindly has dropped a link into the chat. You can uh, link the Common Ground website there to make an offering for Angela this evening, or you can visit the Common Ground website. Thank you so much, everyone, for your practice. Thank you, Thank you so much joining us, Angela. And Angela has been here me. with us almost every time. So I love this <laughs> song. I love this yeah. song. Yeah, yeah. All right. Take good care, everyone.